a look at the antenna. We're gradually moving out and the antenna is a direct copy from Marconi, totally stolen. Twelve towers, 820 foot high. Now to give you an idea, the highest building in, in Edmonton is about 400 feet. Or if you want, it's about two-thirds the height of the Eiffel Tower. Higher than the Calgary Tower, the Husky Tower. Ten foot to a side, triangle. Mount it all on, six great big porcelain, you imagine the weight, but six porcelain insulators on the antenna, each antenna uh, pylon or aerial. And each one had a lift on it that could handle three men at a time or the antenna up and down. Each one weighed 200 ton and at the top, although they were guided at five spots on the way down, they still swayed in the wind four or five feet. They were the biggest thing in England at the time and they were made, of course, before the Eiffel Tower, so they were one of the tallest structures that man made in the world at that time. Here's how the antenna worked. A bit of a curious shape, quarter mile spacing. You can imagine holding up a wire that big around once every quarter of a mile. <laughs> but they did that. So it was six kilometer long antenna, but they could hook them up in some interesting ways. They could hook them up as one antenna, and this was the central building and they could connect up in different ways and different phases so they could use the antenna. 16, 32, or 64 kilohertz. Just by using it in different ways. So there they could chop the antenna up in different ways. But an enormous antenna system. 27 miles of copper were used to form the antenna. And they were arranged in two sections that could be connected or disconnected depending on the frequency in the central building with big switches. Six kilometers long, or if you want, that's 3.75 miles. And six kilometers is about a fifth of a wavelength, so it wasn't even one wave. It was about a fifth of a wave because the wave at 16 kilohertz is 18.75 kilometers. When it was completed, the antenna had almost a half a microfarad capacitance. Now this is desirable, believe it or not, because they're using the ground wave, not the air wave. They're actually using the ground wave. But a half, 0.45 microfarad, had an inductance of 3.85 millihenries, or if you want, about a, well, a third of a henry. And a resistance of, amazingly, dot four ohms, and I mean, that's pretty good. And they kept it pretty clean because to have 12 antennas that big in the porcelain, they still had 8 meg ohms resistance to earth. So they really worked at all those insulators to, to make it work. Had an effective height of, and if you, that, what is that, 3 times 200, so you're looking at around six 700 feet or 180 meters. And finally out at 16 kilohertz, the actual antenna radiating out into the air in electromagnetic waves 29%, not bad for an antenna. We think that's pretty good today even for high frequency antennas if we get one that's 29%. <clears throat> Let's look at some of these amazing numbers. Power, power, power. Well, to start with, the working voltage at the antenna, 165 kilovolts. Now, how do you get 165 off of 160 volt plate? Well, because it's what? It's now through a transformer, eh? So we've got it actually stepped up. Peak to peak, that's 462 kilovolts. Either way, peak to peak. Not at the same time, but that's the stress that the capacitors and the coil have to handle because you multiply it by 2.8. The current, RMS, average current, 750 amps. And the VARs, as you can appreciate, that the current and the voltage were not occurring right in phase. Ideally, they would be, but not was 123 megavars of power. Now you can appreciate that's wattless power if they're 90 degrees out of phase, but they weren't because we actually had about a, a megawatt going out. So well over the peak power instantaneously was probably around 3 megawatts peak, but it was keyed off and on. But it could sustain 
constant carrier a megawatt without stalling the generator. To keep all this cool, two great big ponds outside, each one with a million gallons and a heat exchanger to cool them. Very special distilled water inside with not so clean water outside. And in fact, the post office, and I was working for the post office, had a marvelous <laughs> greenhouse and we kept everyone in tomatoes in the whole <laughs> rugby area because we grew tomatoes in the cooling, because the cooling water kept them hot. So we didn't have to heat the building in the winter and we certainly cooled it in the summer because we had, as I told you, about dot four of a megawatt being heating in the room. <clears throat> to make a good ground for this was a, another significant job. 120 miles of copper buried just a few inches under the ground. The ground there was very conductive. At 1,600 feet on either side of the antenna, big strip all the way around. So a mile is what, 5,000? So quarter of a mile on both sides of the antenna, there was a grid of copper in the ground to get that energy into the ground. Because whatever you put up, you've got to put an equal amount down or it's, it's got to, it has to go somewhere. Just to give you an idea, and I didn't work here at all, but remember that in this big stuff, they had a receiver. <laughs> and the receiver was at wherever, Warrington, Wiltshire, totally in England, you can't be very far away, but 50, 60 miles away, and it used a very interesting beverage antenna. And I looked up, I'd never even heard of it, to be honest. It's an interesting antenna. It uses terminations at either end. Well, you certainly couldn't use it in a transmitter because those would be <laughs> kilowatt hot, big resistors at either end. But it's actually a long wave antenna with the characteristic impedance at both ends terminated in them. And good old Mr. Betridge was an Englishman, and he invented this, and the British used it for their receiver. Yeah. So they received in one spot, and 50 miles away transmitted in a different spot, just so the two wouldn't interfere. Because if you turned the thing on, in close, that whole thing would just melt. <laughs> it would be a receiving antenna. It would pick up kilowatts of power and just cook the entire receiver. Later on, they moved it up to Cooper in Fifeshire in Scotland. Then they had a loop antenna, which, by the way, Morley, remember your crystal set with a very effective loop antenna? Well, they built one that was <laughs> seven square miles, and it worked very well. I don't know how many of you remember a lecture from Morley. He had a wonderful little crystal set here with about a four foot, three foot, four foot antenna. Four foot square. Four foot square. Worked very well. We could, we could actually hear the stations on it. So, yes, they used the same thing. Again, we're still moving on. We've covered sort of the technology of it, but they did some exciting things. They improved the stability. Before this, transmitters and receivers wandered with temperature and humidity and everything. They couldn't hold frequency. But they experimented. Western Electric in the States built a big transmitter and receiver, and they actually had double sideband still, but they put voice. They excited the thing with voice and they actually had two-way transmissions. Now here's the interesting part. At 60 kilohertz, they used the same amplifier, the same antenna, they just drove it at 60 kilohertz rather than at 60. And it worked. So in 27, they established one voice channel across the ocean that you could actually talk on. And in 31, a few years later, they actually put a 32, which is, of course, double the frequency of the 16, on the same antenna, 50 watts still, 50 kilowatt, lattice exciter. Now think about this. I don't know if you know what a lattice is. It's a full bridge, just like your full wave rectifier in your radio. But it had to handle 50 kilowatts each diode. These were great big mercury arc diodes Again, they were that big around, big, big plate. You could open them up, change the filaments in them, because they had to handle 50 each diode, because one switches on and the other in a balanced lattice bridge. They had to have each one handle continuously 50 kilowatts in one tube. <laughs> so that was a pretty impressive diode. And there we go. So they actually had at one sideband, they suppressed the other one and 
using the same linear amp as we saw, they put out 32 kilowatts on the antenna, sorry, 32 kilohertz on the antenna, 300 kilowatts, and they had single sideband. And by this time, they had crystals they'd invented, and they could actually control the receivers enough that they didn't wander off frequency, and they were beginning to have communication around the world, still low frequency, but they could actually talk on it with fairly good reliability, because if some of you may know, single sideband is probably, what, four or six times sort of better at sending a signal out than not, than uh, full double sideband. So this single sideband, again, was one of the first single sideband in the world in 31, and it became the standard for all telephone companies and almost all radios, the commercial radio, not uh, AM public radio. So it was used by the telephone company all over the world, and single sideband now out because of digital, but became a standard. And they were using it in 1931 across the Atlantic. Now some bad news. <laughs> Nothing to do with the war, interestingly, because the war was raging, but something else was raging at the same time. In 1940, a tremendous ice storm iced up the antenna. They had automatic stuff that if the antenna was being stressed, there was a release gear that lowered it to the ground. But it was all plugged up with, what, ice, didn't work, it was foggy, <coughs> nothing worked, and the whole thing had to be shut down, and in fact, everything gave way, and several days later, because of real heavy frog, they had, like, the fog was so high they couldn't see what was going on, they couldn't go out and see this, but they found that virtually the whole system, towers and antennas, Insulators had broke, spreaders on the antenna had broke, and they had to completely rebuild it in 1940. So they, what I saw when I was there in the 50s was actually rebuilt, but built identical to the first one, so no difference. But it was had to be completely rebuilt. And more bad luck, again during the war, but interestingly it was never bombed because it wasn't used for military purposes and shipping actually used this thing. It was a lifesaver. So it wasn't used in the Second World War or the First World War, it wasn't built in the first, but anyway, the, the woodwork in the roof had got dirty enough, dusty enough, wet enough, I'm not sure, but the RF, which was always heating all the time, actually caught the roof on fire and the whole place burnt <laughs> and they couldn't put the fire out. They shut the transmitter down but they couldn't uh, do anything. It was gutted and they rebuilt it again <laughs> in 43 and got it back working. So at this time the steam was still there. They augmented the steam plant because they had by this time a whole bunch of HF and RF amplifiers and transmitters. They had maybe 15 or 20 different uh, transmitters by 1943, not just the one. So they put in, steam plant was still running, turning this great big generator, but they added a generator that was uh, diesel, six cylinder, blast injected diesel running again at 300 RPM because it was on the same shaft as the steam engine. And they further modified it and added still another engine, an English electric side valve with a 12 hour rating of 1.3, uh, uh, 1350 British horsepower and a 30 second rating of 1600. How did they get that? Well, they put a whopping big flywheel, tons and tons of flywheel on it because, think about it, every time you keyed the uh, radio on, you've got a megawatt, and then suddenly off. So if you didn't have the flywheel, the engine would race and then stop, race and stop. It was terribly hard on any engine because you had a one megawatt change in load, off and on, off and on. So very special with a very big flywheel. Now, and by this time, there were many other transmitters using the power, not just the low frequency. We'll see about those in a minute or two. So. They added these two generators, they were supercharged, and combined with all this, the combined power was 2.8 megawatts of energy, and by the way, by this time they'd added, interestingly, 60 hertz AC, not 50. The whole country worked on 50, but they stayed off the grid and worked at 60. The reason was that 60 worked far better, because by this time they were a time standard, 
and the 60 just kind of worked in because they actually synchronized their 60 hertz to, we're getting there, the world standard clock at the time, which was Greenwich, not the United States. So at this point, it was the largest steam plant anywhere in the world, like, and uh, diesel combined. But the post office was producing this and still using it, even though it wasn't what we consider post, but basically for ships. So I'm going to shift pace a little bit because what was I actually doing there? Well, I was actually working on the standard time clock most of the time because it needed daily work. But for 77 years, rugby radio broadcast twice a day a time signal at 16 kilohertz, which many people may even remember because we could pick it up in this country. It was the best time. And like people like CBC would pick it up and then use it for their did 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 pause button time signal that used to go on at 12 o'clock and they would synchronize to it. They called it modulated standard frequencies and it came right from the British Physics Lab in about four frequencies. Whoa, well that's, see if we can go back, one, two, there we go. So originally, and this equipment was there when I was working, now we're actually getting to the time I was there, they had three very accurate crystals in an oven, they were accurate to one or two parts in 10 to the 7th, in other words 10 million, but not very accurate by today's standards. They were divided by tubes like 6 AU7s all the way down to one second and so on. And these frequencies were going out. They had by this time different signals at GBT 2.5 meg, 5 meg, 10, 15, and 20 meg, they put out time signals as well as 16. So by this point, they were putting out accurate frequencies, so accurate the rest of the world could synchronize to them and use them for their generation. And in fact, the post office used this clock where I was working to synchronize all its carriers because it fed a 16K signal that was synchronized to these crystals and then all the single sideband all worked at the same time. Interesting. All these services have been done in because you can buy a cesium clock or a iridium clock for two or three thousand dollars from Hewlett Packard today. But they were the state of the art. And my job, bays of tubes, all double triodes, and each double triode was hooked up as a JK flip-flop, which you know divides the frequency by two. So they had to go from millions of cycles down to, well, 24-hour clock, in fact, part-time. So the equipment was used, actually, each crystal had two dividers so that we could turn one off and maintain and keep the other one going. Three crystals, so that was six sets of dividers on bays all in the room, and we could turn any one off without screwing the thing up. And the three crystals always compared with each other, and if any one was out, it used the rather simple logic that the one that was different to the two must be wrong, and it dismissed it and used the two, and then the engineers would run out and try and fix the one that wasn't the same as the rest, which inevitably was a tube problem, not a crystal problem. So they compared them, and any divergence was ignored. By the time I got there, and this is a little past, they upgraded these three crystals to something called an Essen ring. Again, an Englishman invented this, but it was still crystals, but a different way. They hung on, a, of all things, a silk thread, and they were a little more accurate. So we were still moving on, and at the same time, we experimented because we had these large bays, but at the time I was there, I actually worked on installing a cesium clock. This was state-of-the-art, first one in Britain, and it was ten parts, or one and two parts in ten to the tenth. So we went from ten to the seventh, ten to the tenth, times three, well, a thousand times more accurate, but still not too great. And this one now was compared with the crystals, so we now had three crystals, each one with two dividers, making six, and two dividers, still all tubes, no transistors, dividing the high frequency coming out of the piece of radiating cesium that radiates at a standard rate all the way down. And in 67, which is, I must say, after I left, they then took all of that and added one more, the rubidium clock, which is, again, more accurate. And the rubidium clock, 
10 part in 11. So they actually increased it by 10, or if you want, one second every 3,000 years. And this is pretty state of the art in 67. It's old hat today, but interestingly, nobody's improved on it. There isn't a clock more accurate than that in the world. Now, there are lots of them. And they all today, by the way, all these clocks all home in on Colorado Springs, including Russia during the Cold War. And again, compared, if theirs were out, they broke free, but everybody's synchronized. Why? Because data won't work if you're not synchronized. If you think time is going faster than me, data isn't worth poop because it, it'll get all garbled up. So they still use it. Now, a little later on, the Trident class submarines started using the site because they, I told you they don't use it, didn't use it for time anymore, and NATO used it to talk to all their submarines, all secret hush hush stuffs after I left. But anyway, there we go. And these people went through all this, and the submarines dragged a long antenna, and they could talk to Britain, and then they would feed this out to the NATO nations underwater without ever coming up. Here's a picture of the end. <laughs> we are getting near the end. The, in 2003, they blew up one of the guy wires, and each antenna fell down. So, an interesting end. The Navy didn't renew the post office's contract and went to somebody else. But up to this time, they'd continually used it. Now, we're going to... You're right. I don't know why it doesn't start. <laughs> Help me out. Close the air time now, so it's two minutes. They did it at night so there wouldn't be spectators, but that didn't work. <laughs> what you see there is a helicopter and it's searching with infrared so that if there's any human beings near these antennas, it would uh, detect them so that they make sure that, because they're looking at something that's three or four square miles. <laughs> the Claxton and we're going to see these 820 foot antennas falling. They did it actually over two days. That delay is just the sound coming in from the break there, it's the explosions. <laughs> this is definitely a home movie, but pretty impressive to drop something 820 feet. That's it. And Too bad they didn't make razors out of it or something. Yeah, well, we'll just, I'll try and go back one. Uh -huh. uh, there we go. That's what it looked like when it's down. The actual, right here, was mounted those uh, insulators that the whole thing sat on. and all Five guy wires all the way down, about every 30 or 40 feet on the guy wire insulators, because the guy wires would look like receiving antennas and melt if they didn't break them all up in little chunks all the way down. So today? Well, it's all gone, but VHF is still used by submarines underwater. In case you're wondering how they use them, they trail about a two mile long insulated wire out the back of the submarine. <laughs> and get dial tone. <laughs> underwater. And they look at the potential difference between the submarine as one end of the antenna and the end of the wire at the other end. So they still use them underwater when they're not up on the surface using satellites and all the new magic. They can actually use them. Um, at one time, the Eiffel Tower apparently was used by the French. And at the moment, there's a very big submarine station. Not the rugby's not used. It's closed down. But uh, the Americans have apparently one rather secret, I don't know where it is, but somewhere around Seattle, again, near the ocean. So VHF, very low frequency, still used, but not at rugby. Rugby is over. <laughs> and some of my memories, well, it started in 1910 with not even valves, and in, 19, in 2007, well, those summers are happy memories for me, but they were a little while ago, and some of my friends still keep track of and 
Rugby still operates some high, volt, uh, high frequency stuff, but no low frequency at all, and it's all, quote, special Navy secret stuff. Nobody knows where it is, but it isn't the post office. So it's not public. They still have it as a Navy transmitting yard. And are there any questions? Is the big generator still existing? I wouldn't know. I would guess it still is there, and I'm guessing that they don't run the steam one for pollution reason, but they can, like, they're all clutched together. They're probably running the diesels now. And again, when the one, the new magic still works there for the Navy. <laughs> yeah. Well, the tar plaster seals, did you ever have any bad vacuum leaks on those tubes? Oh, yeah, and that's what we would be repairing. In fact, the whole tubes would sometimes arc and all sorts of, like, a, a filament would break yeah. and uh, drop down and but we there was engineers fixing them 24 hours a day 365 days of the year yeah. but we could turn any one of them off there were five bays and we could turn them off and keep the other ones running so we were continually maintaining them yeah and it was plumbing you know there was water to be shut yeah. off and yeah. drained big bolts to be undone on these things and then you got the seal to crack and yeah, seal the like, cracks with plasticine yeah. bolt it all back together it was squished together this way, and then stand all back, check it that it wasn't going to arc because there was 165,000 volts between the top and the bottom of those bays. They were meggered, and then cautiously connected back up with great big knife switches. All very <laughs> maintainable, <laughs> all manual. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know if anybody got uh, electrocuted. Like Luckily, I didn't. <laughs> As I said, I, I stopped blowing in the dark sometime after I left there. <laughs> Was there any samples or pictures of any of those things? Well, just the bays of them, and they were—they just looked like because they were completely covered. Because remember, it's a water jacket around them. They were just a steel tube that was this high and that big around, ten in a row and ten on the back, giving you the twenty. So like the filament was suspended. The filament was up, yeah. Up the the filament at the bottom plate at the top yeah. And so it must have been insulated. The uh, the cylinder must have been insulated. Oh yeah, there was uh, to, the, the plate was set in uh, porcelain down the middle of the steel tube, and that took the 160,000 mm -hmm. volts. Holy porcelain and again it was sealed mechanic. It wasn't sealed like you you took that apart and put that together each time. But the plate hung in a in a a lump, a circle of that big round of porcelain. And I don't know if you know, but for every 10,000 volts, electricity will jump in standard temperature about what one millimeter. But of course, much greater if you reduce the pressure. So they had these things. The plate in them was only about that size, and it would run all the time, red hot, just from bombardment. Yeah. How, how long would it take to cool them off after you shut them down? I don't know, I can't give you an answer, but oh, several hours. Yeah, it wasn't. But remember, they're water cooled, so I mean, it happened like nobody stuck their hand in to find out. There was just a procedure, and they, the minute you turned the power off, basically they were cool, okay, because of the water jacket on them. So they, it would be rather quick because we didn't turn the water off until they were cool. Then we had to turn the water off, drain the uh, totally sterile water out because sterile water is a pretty good insulator and then work on them and put them back together. Was there a part number? Like rugby number one or something? Like I don't that? know that and I would guess that they were like made by the post office and they were never used by anybody else in the world I'm guessing. But I've worked on the ones here in Edmonton for the, no, let's get it right, in Calgary, not here, but the, the mercury, I don't know if any of you have seen the mercury arc lamps that are uh, tubes that uh, change the, for the trolley buses, for the old street cars. Yeah. They were about that big around, so high, and then a plate, but they worked the same way. It was just a diode, but I believe they were each 600 amp at 600 volts. And a pool of mercury down in the mm -hmm. filament, and the filament was fatter than your thumb, and you could crawl inside and change the parts in them and they were continue evacuated so and I don't know when we got rid of them because I'm not sure when silicon controlled rectifiers could outperform but it must have been what the 60 late 60s 70s before you could get a 600 amp silicon controlled rectifier on a big cooling fin to replace them which they now use or triax today actually I believe
That wasn't, by the way, I'll be honest, I never did one. That was somebody else's work. I was doing the new stuff. I was the new boy and I could actually work with six AU7s. Had some British number, 6282 or something, four digit number, but thousands of these, testing them and setting up the cesium clock was my job. But I watched other people doing that. Anything else? It's two o'clock. Thank you. And thank Rick for the...